All right, welcome to our Wednesday evening service. Let's all get us a hymn book, and let's turn to page number 51. 51. Congratulations, preacher, on 26 years. You're a quarter of a century old. Have I remain standing, I'm going to ask Dennis if he'll open our service now with prayer.
for me a glad tomorrow where gates of pearl swing open wide and when I've passed this fell of sorrow I'll dwell upon the other Someday I'll hear the angels sing Beyond the shadow of the tomb And all the bells of heaven ring While saints are singing home sweet home someday beyond the reach of mortal king someday God only knows just where and when the wind of mortal life shall all stand still and I shall go to dwell on Zion's someday my labors will be ended And all my wanderings will be over. And all earth's broken ties be mended. And I shall sigh and weep no Someday the dark clouds will be rifted And all the night of gloom be passed And all life's burdens will be lifted The day of rest shall dawn at last. Someday beyond the reach of mortal king. Someday God only knows just where and of mortal life shall all stand still and I shall go to dwell on Zion's Man, that was just a song I was going to sing tonight. Jim took my song. Good to see everybody this evening. Hope everybody did have a good day. And I uh, appreciate your coming out this evening right here in the middle of uh, the heat of summer. Uh, everybody comfortable enough tonight? Temperature okay? How many folks we got in here are too cold? Anybody? Bernie, of course. How many, how many is too hot? Okay. Maybe let's just switch seats in. Yeah, I never dreamed 25 years ago I'd be looking in your all's eyes 25 years later. But uh, where in the world is time going? 
You know, it seemed like no sooner do we uh, end the service and we're back here again. It's, all, it's, it's almost like time is going by so quickly. Uh, we're going, one of these days, I'm afraid we're going to meet ourselves at the door coming back. Uh, it just seemed like weeks do go by in a hurry, don't they? Well, this evening, if you would, turn to Exodus chapter number 17. Just uh, bring a few thoughts here tonight from uh, this chapter. Appreciate you being here this evening and appreciate all of those that are uh, checking us out uh, through uh, YouTube and Facebook and so forth. But I want to read chapter 17 and verses 1 through 7 and talk a little bit tonight about the subject of unbelief, the evil of unbelief. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and start on verse number 1 where it says, In all the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, we know it wasn't uh, the, Is the Israelitish First Baptist Church. I mean, you know, the word congregation Sometimes people think, well, it must have been a church. Uh, no, it's just, just the speaking, of course, about the gathering of Israel. The congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give me water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod where, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock of Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa, and, and Mer Mer Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, and I want you to notice now this question, is the Lord among us or not? That's a brash statement when you stop and think about it. They said, is the Lord among us or not? And I'd almost say tonight, how dare they say that? But then, I fast forward several thousand years and I find myself in this dispensation and then I consider the people of God, myself included, and I think of how there are times that all of us still have the audacity uh, to question what God's doing. I know uh, sometimes difficult being honest but church is a good place to be honest when you're going to be honest. But I think we all from time to time, we reach certain places in our life uh, to where we wonder where is the Lord. You know, what's God doing? Uh, how is God intervening? And we ask those questions. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening for this passage of scripture that we've read. And Lord, I pray tonight that you'll enable us to make sense out of what has been read. And Lord, especially this evening, may uh, we ask ourselves the question, what is, what is in Exodus chapter 17 for me? What is there in this passage that I need to learn personally and to apply it? So Lord, help us this evening to approach uh, this portion of your word with that in mind. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this certainly was a foolish question that Israel asked. Uh, to ask the question, uh, is the Lord among us or not? I mean, of all people and of all times to ask that question. I mean, really, when you think of what God had done for Israel and in the presence of Israel and for Israel to turn around and make a statement like that, it's really kind of mind-boggling, mind isn't it? Basically, they were saying, where's God? 
Where is God? May I suggest this evening that unbelief is always bad. In any way, shape, or form, unbelief is always bad. But I believe it takes a new level of badness when it's directed against God. It takes a new level of badness. I mean, unbelief in any circumstances is always wrong. But sometimes, unbelief is exercised in the face of obvious uh, workings of God. And that's where it really becomes bad. No people has ever witnessed God's presence and power any more than Israelites. Yet the Bible says they tempted him and they questioned his presence among them. They literally tempted the Lord. You know, when I was studying for this message tonight, I thought of how we can take something that's being done today and uh, see a little bit of it being done right here and we see in both instances it didn't work. And I'm talking about free handouts. Now, uh, the, the, the history of Israel going through the wilderness was a history of free handouts. God kept handing them something, kept giving them what they needed, kept feeding them, kept giving them water, kept supplying their needs. But here's the thing that's astounding. The free handouts didn't lead to faith. Even though they would have had, had to have acknowledged that their food came from God and everything else came from God, it sure didn't help their faith any. And that kind of, you know, we think about that tonight and we can see a parallel thought even today in society the way it is with the free government handouts. How is that helping people? It's destroying the purpose, one of the purposes uh, for God creating us, giving us ingenuity, creativity, a mind. And uh, he put us to work from day one. You know, if you don't work, uh, you're worse than an infidel, basically, the Bible teaches. So now, in the case of Israel, the free handouts surely didn't help their faith. I mean, what were they thinking? They'd get up in the morning, the food would be there. I mean, they'd be waiting on them. All they do is gather the manna in all the other instances. But yet, here we see them now basically saying, where's God? That's amazing, isn't it? Where's God? The miracles, by the way, that uh, took place in the wilderness typified Christ. You knew that. The manna reminds us of Bethlehem. The manna. Jesus is a manna come down from heaven. We uh, are reminded of Bethlehem. Then the smitten rock reminds us of Calvary. Jesus the rock was smitten at Calvary. Then the water flowing out of the rock reminds us of Pentecost, that refreshing water, reminding us of the Holy Spirit of God. Israel displayed unbelievable unbelief in the face of undeniable miracles. Well, let's say that again. Israel displayed unbelievable unbelief in the face of undeniable miracles. That's a mouthful, but it was true. Now, this proves it. The night of the Passover. What did God do? He passed through the land that night. The Israelites that had complied with what God had said to do, well, the oldest in the family, oldest son was safe. And so God was proven to be who he is. They saw a miracle in the Passover. Then the Red Sea. Now keep this in mind. These are, these are the same people that went through on dry ground. And now they're saying, where's God? 
They walked through on dry ground. So the miracle at the Red Sea, the manna that came out uh, from heaven on a daily basis. But now, here's a good point, ladies and gentlemen, I want to give, give uh, us to chew on this evening. While the pathway that was designed for Israel was a divine pathway, it was not a cakewalk. It was not a cakewalk. It was a divine pathway. God led them through the wilderness. They went a certain way, but it wasn't a cakewalk because they got hit with issues. They had their problems. They had their challenges. They had their, the things that went on in the wilderness, so it was still not a cakewalk. Neither is the Christian life. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but those steps are not a cakewalk from the time that we say, say yes to Jesus Christ, we said yes until the time that, like Paul, in a sense we'll say I'm now ready to be offered. From the time we said yes until the time our life down here ends, it's gonna be struggles. It's not a cakewalk. It's going to be difficulties and so forth, and you already know that, I'm, I'm sure. A lesson to us, though, and here's a good lesson. I want, to, I, want to, I want us to see from this text. Here's a good lesson, folks. We need to always view suffering through the prism of the cross. Always. View suffering through the prism of the cross. What did Peter say? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. That's First Peter 4, 12. For you folks are taking notes. He said, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. When it comes to the fiery trial, I mean, don't have the attitude, how did this happen? I don't deserve this. This really is not part and parcel of what I signed up for so to speak. Why me, Lord? I mean, I'm trying to live the Christian life, trying to do the best thing, trying to serve God. Why me, Lord? Peter said, don't be shocked by it. As though some strange thing happened unto you, the Christian life is not a cakewalk. Israel proves it. They were ready to stone Moses. I mean, isn't that amazing? They were ready to stone Moses. What they should have done is stone their unbelief. They should have looked in the mirror and they should have said, it's me, O Lord, that standeth in the need of prayer. It's me who's the culprit, who's guilty. The, uh, the evil of their unbelief is magnified in that they tempted God in spite of, of all he had done and was doing for them. God's heart and hand was seen, yet they acted like he was dead. Now tell me, if a passage like this doesn't have some bearing today on all of us. I mean, I'm, I know I'm looking in the faces this evening of the saints of God, but I'm not looking into the faces tonight of perfect saints of God. I'm looking into the faces of people that know what I'm talking about. I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road, really. Now, I want us to trace briefly this evening. I've got to where I hate to even use that word briefly. If I've ever lied anywhere, it's in the pulpit, and I regret it. From here on out, ladies, do me a favor. When I say, in a few minutes, would someone be, and I'll take it right, raise your hand and say, preacher, remember what you just said. But I'd like to think this though. Just one little caveat I'll add. I'm not repeating myself though, am I? As long as I'm not doing that. <laughs> so so if, if it's continually new, I'm not justified. It. I am going ahead a little early here, sure enough. I'll let Jim have about uh, five minutes to do this. Just kidding. I want us to trace our evil belief just shortly here tonight. 
And notice God's patience and provision. But look at their unbelief. First of all, they failed the no water test. Did y'all see that? They failed the no water test. Verse one. I'm not making this up now. I look at verse one. If there, was, there was no water for the people to drink. Uh, last part of verse one. They failed the no water test. Well, how'd they fail it? Well, for one thing, they became bitter, and you've heard this before, they became bitter rather than better, didn't they? It's easy to sing all the way my Savior leads me while everything is going well, but what about when the bottom drops out? They failed the no water test. There wasn't any water. But, that, but here's the point. That didn't mean that there never would be water. I mean, there have been times in our lives there's been no water, but um, I like to, and I can speak for myself, I, I'm sure you could, could too. There's never been a time that the well totally dried up Deliverance from sin, and surely we know this this evening, deliverance from sin does not mean immunity from problems. If we don't know that, we surely need to know it by now. This is one of the greatest afflictions, though, when there's no water. I mean, really, we're told that one of the most excruciating forms of punishment is thirst. Thirst. And you know, uh, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it just a moment here, but, but testing, uh, th- this no water testing, there's something that can be said here though. Testing, by the way, and I'm using the word testing, it's a method of determining how we've learned. Now, testing is a method of determining how well we're learning. Life is full of tests, isn't it? When I was in Bible college, I had one particular professor that gave the same types of tests all the time. And uh, I failed, I don't know how many of his tests because I did not, he gave the multiple choice test. Now, I, I realize multiple choice tests, you can shoot from the hip sometime, you can guess. But I never learned how to guess the right one when I didn't know it. I've heard people that just come out smiling. They said, I think I got it right. But I always, uh, I learned those to say, I think, I always flunked. That's the worst kind of testing. That, that professor, I, I met him here not too long ago. I went to the funeral of Dr. Hull Bowman. He was there. And I told him, I said, I, said, I considered you uh, the most difficult teacher that I have ever had. And I said, you laid it on me. In fact, he flunked me. Hey, do you know, I don't mind telling you. I've, got to work. I've been here 25 years. What have I got to lose? I flunked the course, ladies and gentlemen. Did you believe that? It was a history. But I took it over and passed it the second time. And I'm telling you, I hated that kind of a test. Maybe I need to try to make myself feel better tonight and ask the question, have any of y'all ever flunked a course? But this was, this was the no water test. They flat boloed it. They said there's no water. As if there never would be water. But now testing, by the way, is important. Do you know that every time we read the scriptures, we're being tested? Think about that. And do you know I can prove that? I can prove it with a verse. Romans 15, four proves that. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So there is a test when we read the scriptures, the test is, what does 
this passage have to say to me? How does it apply to me? Am I living up to the principles that are in this text? In other words, when we read the word of God, we're a student, not only a reading student, we're a student being tested while we read. We're tested as we study even this account. Trust me, we didn't come to church tonight just to do the, the, the normal Wednesday night thing. You and I are being tested tonight. I'm not just delivering my Wednesday night sermon out of duty to this church. I'm delivering a test. This passage of scripture tonight needs to grip our hearts and cause us to probe ourselves and ask ourselves the question, well, how, how am I about belief? What about the no water test? Am I passing it? I mean, again now, that's what we see here. What am I to learn from this? Now, so number one, here's what I'm saying. They failed the no water test. Number two, here's what we see. Their reaction proved they failed. Their action proved it. Verse number two, it says there, it says the people did chide. Hadn't heard that word for a while, have y'all? Said they chide, they did chide with Moses. They said, give us water, we may drink. And Moses said to them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Moses said, you might be chiding with me, but you're tempting the Lord while you're chiding with me. That's pretty serious stuff, isn't it? Now, by the way, chide means to strive or contend. They basically were questioning God's faithfulness and God's power to take care of them. That's what they were doing. They were questioning God's faithfulness and power. And then in the process, they were playing the blame game. Blame Moses. Moses became the punching bag. That's what happened. <clears throat> they didn't like what God had to say. They took the spot out of Moses. They blamed Moses. Now, let me bring this this evening into perspective. God's word is what we preach and obey, always has been, always will be. It's the word of God. It is our standard for faith and practice. And a preacher is only a messenger boy. That's all we are. We're only a messenger boy. And you know, it's easy to hammer the messenger when we don't like the message. And I've learned that, that happens, and I've seen that happen a few times. The messenger gets hammered when the message is not received many times. Conviction sets in, and conviction works in strange ways. Do you know I've seen conviction go all the way from cold shouldering to fierce words, even to a fist fight. Do y'all believe that? Now, let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> Back in the days, before men started wearing dresses, they settled a lot of things on the outside. I mean, back in the days where people duked it out and fought it out, and I mean, they just, that's just the way it was. You know, uh, we didn't grow up in the Old West, but some of those old days were like the Old West. Boys would go off to school, scrapple sometimes, get in a fight and so forth. I've done a little bit of that. I was always short, though. I'll have to tell you this evening, uh, I was kind of on the wrong end of things many times. I remember one time, this guy, I mean, I'm telling you, I had to look straight up. The guy was tall. He had me mad. I was trying to get at him. I'm just a little old short fella. I mean, <laughs> maybe I ought to tell this, but if I could have got to him, I'd have killed him. He had this bad. I was going like, I was trying to get to that guy, and he was so tall and big, he just kept thumping me. I wasn't a Christian back then. If I would have, I'd prayed, Lord, let me grow up to be seven feet tall and go back, go back and square up with that guy. But now, but I'm talking about conviction though. I've seen people get under conviction and sometimes get violent. 
I mean, they'd break bad. I know a preacher, and Bernie knows who I'm talking about. This goes back to their Pennsylvania days. There was a preacher that they had in their church in Pennsylvania years ago. And there was this young guy in the community that got drunk, the way the story's been told. Uh, and I'm not gonna mention his name. I, I can remember what Carol told me about this guy. But anyway, this, man, this guy got mad at the preacher. And he's gonna clobber the preacher. But my father-in-law, who happened to be pretty tough in those days, he was a policeman, he stood between. Uh, the guy went out to the preacher, and my father-in-law stood between uh, in front of the preacher, and the blow landed on him. And you all know Bud McCurdy, some of y'all been around here for a while. That guy now, when it started out, he was, he was about half drunk that's fighting this preacher, but I'll tell you one thing, Bud sobered him up. Bud turned him every way but loose. Now, I'm, I, I'm saying all that to say this this evening. Sometimes conviction can get pretty extreme. That guy didn't like the preacher. He'd gone after the preacher. But uh, there happened to be this guy that loved the Lord and loved him that stood in, uh, stood in front of him. But I'm just saying tonight, that's just an application. You can take it any way you want to. It's just a story, uh, but a true one. But, uh, but anyway, Israel right now is ready to stone Moses. Tell me that there isn't a parallel, though. I mean, they could have killed, if they'd got their chance, killed God's man. That's how violent they were. Then I want you to note something here very quickly. Verse number four, the man of God didn't take matters into his own hands, he placed them into God's hands though. Because verse four says, Moses cried unto the Lord saying, what shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. You know, we're to do the same, aren't we? We can't handle the issues. We can't handle the stresses and the threats of life. We have to just take it to the Lord. Neither know, I, know we what to do, but our eyes are upon these, the king said. That's how we treat things. And then finally, last of all, verses five and six, God gave two things. Gave two things. It says in verse five, the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people, take with thee the elders of Israel, my rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I'll stand before thee there upon the rock. In Horeb, thou shalt smite the rock. There shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God gave two things, two things. God gave water, but more importantly, God gave a type. He gave water to type. And I can prove it was type. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 says, and that's not a CB I'm talking about here. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and it all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Old Testament type of Christ smitten. Psalm 61, verse two, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Praise God for that rock higher than we are. Psalm 78, 35, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. So the rod now speaks of divine judgment and the smitten rock speaks of his crucifixion and then the water reminds us of the Holy Spirit of God. John 7 in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That would remind us of Pentecost, wouldn't it, somewhat? So the water speaks of the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, God gave two things. Gave a type, and he did give them water. So uh, when Israel said there's no water, uh, the only thing Israel could say and be honest about, they didn't have it to that point. But they were about to be given water. God's always that way. God will always answer in his own time. He's an on time God about everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening for this study we've had. And I pray that you would bless it to our understanding and to our application. And may we all this evening be good students of this passage of scripture and pass the test tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You come on, Brother Jim. <clears throat>